of our uh, uh, IGP Trishu program in connection with the Antimicrobial Awareness Week. Yesterday we had a wonderful talk by Dr. Srinivasan. So, we should know when to prescribe and when to not prescribe. Not only uh, whether we are right or not, the question is. Sir, sir, please unmute, sir. Okay, sir. AK sir, please unmute. AK sir, please unmute, sir. So, whether we are right or not, that is important. Eh? Then, if you are writing it, whether it is a proper dose, proper duration, right antibiotic, and whether we are to give panel antibiotic, whether oral will do. Because many times we are seeing five days antibiotic for sore throat, which is totally inodicate also. So we are seeing uh, seven days of UTA treatment, that also totally inodicate. And dose also very small. So not only whether we have to give antibiotic or not, other things also will matter. And if you are using indiscriminate of use of antibiotics, as we already seen, it will lead to antibiotic resistance, which we are all facing. Even in the PACU, NACU, resistant to all antibiotic, resistant to all, is a routine nowadays. So I think uh, Dr. Kavita will uh, elaborate on antibiotic resistance and how antibiotic resistance are developing. So before we starting in the scientific program, I invite uh, Dr. Narayanan, our state presenter, to say a few words. Over to Dr. Narayanan. Yeah, good evening, yeah. Dr. Anandayeshwan, Dr. Vedi Shandarwa, uh, senior pediatricians, and my friends. I'm very happy to be with you today on the second day when we are dealing with a very important basic topic, evolution of superbugs by youngster uh, Dr. Kavida Vagis, chaired by our veteran Dr. M.N. Venkadeshwar, sir. Uh, wish you all good, happy learning. Thank you. I invite Dr. Redi Sandaguma to introduce the topic and speaker. Over to Redi Sandaguma. So, good evening, everybody. The topic for the day is evolution of superbugs and mechanism of antibiotic resistance. The speaker for the day is Dr. Kavita Varghis. And indeed, it was a stunning surprise. I don't know what more superlatives to use to know that. Kavita is the speaker of the day because she's our past Jubilee student. I start with a short introduction about Kavita. Kavita completed her MBBS in Jubilee Mission Medical College, Trishu. A one-year stint as tutor in the Department of Pharmacology there inspired her to pursue the subject. She did her MD Pharmacology in Government TD Medical College, Alapura, and her senior residency in Trishur Medical College. She then shifted gears from, from academia to industry and joined the medical team at AstraZeneca as regional medical advisor working in the cardio renal portfolio. She is now the medical excellence manager in the same company and helps streamline the medical affairs activity. I'm sure she's doing a great job there. And uh, she has one more word to add about herself. That is... The greatest achievement, guess what? Anybody having a guess? Okay, it's having twins, a boy and a girl, in the, and that too in the time of COVID. <laughs> Congratulations, uh, Kavita, Kavita on the second part, and waiting to see pictures of your twins, okay? So we start, yes, the, we start the topic. Sure, I'll just be uh, sharing my screen right now, if you could just confirm if it's visible. Yeah, everything is working. All right, perfect. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, IAP Trishur, for giving me this immense opportunity to come back to the clinical side and to present uh, in front of my teacher's tattoo. So there is uh, zero pressure there. 
<laughs> but yes, it's I'm very happy to be presenting and that too on a topic which is of utmost importance in these days, especially. So without further ado, I would like to get into the topic proper. So we are here to talk about the evolution of antibiotics and how exactly uh, they are actually affecting us and our treatment regimens. So we'll be dealing with this topic with the following outline. I'll talk about the problem statement, and then we'll be getting into the genetics behind antibiotic resistance, the types of resistance, and moving on to the way forward. Now, what is a superbug per se? A superbug refers to a germ that has formed resistance to multiple drugs that actually once treated the infection that the germ had caused. And uh, the term itself, superbug, is developed by the media. It's not a medical term per se. And uh, it cannot just be restricted to bacteria, even fungi can be included in this. And we need to understand how antibiotic resistant evolves to actually come up with key treatment strategies in case we want to overcome this or at least find some solution for patients suffering in this. And why do we need to do that? It's because we have reached a point where there is increasing antibiotic resistance um, that are actually leading to life-threatening infections that physicians are frequently ending up prescribing greater number of more expensive and potentially more toxic antibiotics to treat, which uh, infections that could have been easily dealt with in the past. Excuse me. Sorry about that. That's my kid crying in the background. So yes. Um, now we have the situation where despite 75 years of remarkable antibiotic development, we are still threatened by the prospects of a post-antibiotic era. Now, what does a post-antibiotic era look like? It will look very similar to a pre-antibiotic era where say in 1941, the average life expectancy of a child born in England and that in one of the cities would be 25 years. And we are looking at a similar scenario here. So how did, let's go into penicillin as an example. So in the 1940s, penicillin was discovered, it was used and Staph aureus worked beautifully in terms of being uh, treated by penicillin for us, worked beautifully. And it was around 1950s that they started seeing penicillin resistant strains of Staph aureus in hospitals. And in 1961, methicillin came into the scene. And we thought that this was the cure-all and this was the answer to Staph aureus resistance. But within one year, doctors started encountering methicillin resistant Staph aureus. And today, MRSA can simultaneously resist a laundry list of different antibiotics. And it can also resist vancomycin, which we consider as kind of like the last line of defense. Meanwhile, in the research community, it was around the 1960s where they kind of decided that the problem of bacterial infection was considered solved. And scientific efforts are now directed to other areas like cancer uh, chemotherapy. So there is a dearth of new antibiotics being developed. So that problem is also there. And how do we reach here? This is an evolutionary problem you have to realize that bacteria have exist for more than 3 billion years and the microbes in the environment actually produce antibiotics naturally. And they do this to compete for food and food and other resources. So this particular problem of antibiotic resistance is an ancient one. The modern antibiotic era is about 75 to 80 years old. So long before the use, clinical use of antibiotics, resistance was a well-established means of survival for bacteria exposed to antimicrobials that was produced by other bacteria in the surrounding. So we should not be surprised to find antibiotic resistance going on. What is genuinely surprising is the rapidity of the evolution of resistance in these superbugs and the magnitude of dissemination in that resistance and the ways that these superbugs have learned to adapt to, uh, and absorbing the cost of antimicrobial resistance. We will be talking about the cost of antimicrobial resistance in these superbugs. So let's explore why that is. Now, it's been about 1.9 million years since our ancestors began walking on two legs and the rate of evolutionary change is pretty slow for humans with a, with a mean generational interval of about 30 years. To put it into perspective, E. coli has a generational interval of 20 minutes. So the generational interval of bacteria in contrast is very short. And every two and a half years, E. coli bacteria can go through the same number of generations as humans do in 2 million years. So Howard University recently did a study 
where they took naive E. coli and they put it on a petri dish with different concentrations of antibiotics. And E. coli was able to become so resistant to the antibiotics that it was able to grow in a concentration thousand times the minimum inhibitory concentration, the MIC, within 11 hours. That is staggering. So this, is, this problem is something that develops really fast. And how does that work? Again, let's go back to genetics. So we know about human genetics. We usually transfer genes via vertical transmission. We have, the, uh, we have our parents who give us their genes. If there are any mutations, that's how they give it. Now, bacteria will also do the same. And whenever there is de novo resistance as an adaptation mechanism, uh, it will pass on to its daughter cell. And this vertical transmission mechanism is very important in bacteria like mycobacterium tuberculosis uh, when it's developing resistance towards streptomycin, staph aureus against uh, fluoroquinolones. And you have to remember that these bacteria have short generation times and large population sizes. So they've got an advantage there. But their superpower is not that. The superpower is horizontal transmission. Now, what does that mean? Horizontal gene flow is basically the driving force of bacterial evolution. So what's happening here is that bacteria can pass a DNA back and forth, basically like trading cards. And the scary part is that it can transfer genes across even distantly related species. So it's a bit like when you're picking up the family pet and you wind up with a few cat genes in your genome or for the younger population, it's basically like how Peter Parker got bitten by a radioactive spider and became Spider-Man. And in terms of evolution, this means that bacteria does not have to rely on random mutation to produce a beneficial gene variant. One species might pick up an advantageous gene from another species and the process of natural selection could begin right away. So the new variant uh, can go through the future generations with this antibiotic gene. So horizontal gene flow is extremely important and genes can be acquired in three major formats. One, transformation, two, transduction, and three, conjugation. So let's take a look at those. Transformation is when some bacteria can take up pieces of DNA directly from the liquid ar environment around the cell. Suppose there's a dead bacteria that had antimicrobial resistance genes. When it dies and fragments, the DNA escapes into the surrounding area and another bacteria can pick that up and run with it. So that is how antimicrobial resistance can happen in transformation. Then there is transduction. So bacteriophages are viruses and they usually destroy bacterial cells. But in transduction, the bacteriophages, instead of transferring, uh, of destroying them, transfers DNA that they have picked up from another bacterium into this one. So this can also happen between closely related strains. Lastly, Conjugation. So the process of conjugation can be considered like the bacterial equivalent of sexual intercourse. So during this process, genetic material is transferred from a donor bacterium to a recipient bacterium. Now, there are mobile genetic elements called plasmids, circular, non-chromosomal uh, DNA material. And these plasmids can carry genes that confer resistance to antimicrobials. So as you can see here, when two bacterial cells are in close proximity to each other, a hollow bridge-like structure called a pilus is formed between them. And this will allow for a copy of the plasmid as it is duplicated to pass through the pilus to susceptible bacteria that has now acquired resistance. So since genetics is extremely important in this case, let's take a look at these gene elements a little more in detail. It works a bit like the Russian nesting dolls, a doll within a doll. So we have the resistance genes, which, is, uh, which contains domains that are critical for its function. Now this resistance gene that actually codes for antimicrobial, antimicrobial resistance can be captured by something known as an integron. An integron is extremely dangerous in terms of the fact that it's a gene capturing unit and it can capture not just one, but multiple resistance genes. And it is the key uh, resistant, uh, element in DNA which actually can lead to multiple drug resistance. Now an integron can be part of a transposone and transposone is, usually called jumping genes. Jumping genes mainly because they're able to cut themselves out of the bacterial nucleoid or plasmid, and they can insert themselves into another nucleoid or plasmid. And that can lead to the transmission of antibiotic resistance in a population of bacteria. So we have the transposon, and then we move in, a transposon can be part of a plasmid. A plasmid 
is basically a non-chromosomal DNA element. So the bacteria does not need a plasmid for growth or even survival. A plasmid can be there or not there. It does not harm the bacteria, but a plasmid can code for genetic resistance. So that is why plasmids are so important. And when you were talking, when we were looking at conjugation, that was what we were seeing, a plasmid being transferred from one bacteria to another. And this is the mobile genetic elements. These are the mobile genetic elements that we end up seeing in terms of horizontal transfer. Now, horizontal transfer have a lot of implications when it comes to evolution of bacteria. The first implication is that it can easily speed up the evolution of antibiotic resistance. The second thing is that it can lead to multiple drug resistance. So that is basically the two kinds of bacterial resistance. So just to sum it up, on the left side, you have the mutational or the vertical transmission where there is a low to moderate degree of resistance that's passed on to daughter cells. On the right side, we have acquired resistance. And this is a high level of res resistance that is brought about by horizontal gene transfer. And more importantly, this can happen between unrelated species and genera as well. So let's talk about the resistance process. The fate of any resistant mutant is determined by the complex interplay of three uh, values. One is the strength of selection pressure that is favoring that particular mutant. Second is the mobility of resistance genes. We just saw that mobility bit right now. And lastly, it's the biological cost of carrying that resistance gene. So a there is a balance of pressure and impact of fitness cost that will ultimately determine the size of the population in a mixed population environment. So let's take each one of these aspects in turn. We'll talk about selection pressure. So this is the age old Darwinian biological principle of survival of the fittest. So out here, you'll see that there is a mixed population where there are a lot of susceptible bacteria. And we need to take it for granted that in every patient, there is a pool of susceptible bacteria. And there are some elements, a small percentage would be bacteria that harbor resistance genes. So what we are doing when we are actually adding antibiotics to this mix is that we are inducing selective pressure. So we have to realize that when we're taking an antibiotic, we are not sterilized or we are not being made germ-free. Whenever we give an antibiotic, we are shifting this microbial flora to a more antibiotic resistant species. So it, the selection pressure exists when we use enough antibiotic to interfere with the growth of the majority susceptible population. And whenever there is a pre-existent mutant in that population, they end up getting a growth advantage. And bacteria, they are known to be promiscuous in terms of exchanging their genetic information amongst themselves. And they share the blueprints of how to evade antibiotics. So the bugs that have been exposed to antibiotics will eventually pop, uh, dominate this population. And that is how we end up getting a patient who has MRSA that does not work against a lot of drugs, including vancomycin. Now, on the contrary, if we do not treat this particular population with antibiotics, there is no selective pressure which means there is no selective amplification of the mutant gene. So this is why we need to be very judicial in terms of, judicious in terms of uh, uh, using antibiotics. If, we, if the patient does not require antibiotics, we need to maintain the susceptible bacteria so that later on, if there is a serious infection, it can be treated. So in all this mix of antibiotic evolution, where, I mean, uh, antibiotic resistance evolution, where do antibiotics start? Antibiotics can actually stimulate competence. So competence is basically a stress response. Whenever there is an antibiotic, there's a selection pressure, the ability of the bacteria to generate cells and take up foreign DNA, all of these things will increase because they're trying to survive. And this stress response is amplified by antibiotics. And the scary part is that antibiotics can even increase the mutation rates. So that's how evolution is going even faster. So these are, so whenever you're actually giving an antibiotic, you are potentially entering into a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of a situation. On one side, you want to see your patient cured. But on the other side, each dose contributes in a very real way to the demise of that particular antibiotic. And you're potentially developing a new superbug in that patient. 
So let's look at the pharmacological aspect of this. How does this thing look when we are taking a concentration graph? So we know about the minimum inhibitory concentration, that is the concentration, in, the minimum concentration that where susceptible bacteria ceases to exist. And that is usually the dose with which you start giving the patient antibiotics. There's something else, it's known as the mutant pr uh, production concentration. So that is when resistant mutants will start getting killed off. And there is this mutant selection window between the minimum inhibitory concentration and the minimum inhibitory concentration to prevent a mutant from forming. We have the mutant selection window. And in that window, we start selecting for resistant subpopulations. Now, what happens is that most of the time we end up giving antibiotics to patients in this mutant selection window. The reason being, we don't want the toxic side effects of that drug to appear. So, there, there is no way that we can actually give, uh, we can actually even predict the mutant protection uh, concentration, mutant production concentration of uh, an antibiotic. So we, we go for the safe zone, we go for the MIC. But we need to remember that we need to minimize the length of time the drug concentration remains in the mutant selection window. So on one hand, you have to decide to give it for the appropriate amount of time so that resistant uh, bacteria is not persisting in the population. On the other hand, give it for too long and you can actually lead to even more resistance. So this, there's a very narrow path that the doctor has to learn to travel to. And there is no predicting this and there is no, it's not easy to actually do this. All this, all you need to do is to be conscious of the fact that antimicrobial resistance is a real thing. And the best defense that we probably have is not to give antibiotics when it isn't needed. So we talked about selection pressure. Let's talk about fitness cost of an antibiotic. Now, just because uh, there are resistance genes, this does not mean that you know bacteria can just walk about getting one resistance gene out after the other. There is a cost that it has when it takes up a resistance gene. Sometimes these uh, the resistance genes that has been taken up, it can actually uh, cost the bacteria in terms of the energy requirement or even its ability to grow. So if the transfer gene has no selective advantage to the bacteria, they're usually lost by deletion. So what am I saying here? Am I saying that if, it's, uh, if you remove the bacteria from an environment, that means you're reducing the selection pressure, that there is a reversal of antibiotic resistance? Unfortunately, that's not true. Resistance genes are extremely stable. And just because you stopped giving an antibiotic, that does not mean that the resistance in that population just magically disappears. And once an antibiotic resistant gene is, I mean, that's the determinant that is selected, the probability that it's maintained even in the absence of antibiotic is rather high. An example of this is that in UK, sulfonamides are no longer used, but there is still widespread, use, widespread resistance of sulfonamides. So even though logic would say that removing the selective pressure should turn, the, turn back the tide, that does not happen. And this is in contraindication to the resistance associated with fitness costs. And how we can explain this is that sometimes the gene that is coding for the resistance can also uh, be coding for other useful things, uh, can probably have no cost to the bacteria. So, uh, and it's also worth remarking that there are certain plasmids that can code for toxin antitoxin systems that can impede the loss of that plasmid and that will allow for the maintenance. So uh, what we're seeing here is that sometimes the resistant genes can be so useful to the bacteria that there's even been cases where the bacteria requires an antibiotic to survive. So normally we know that, okay, streptomycin is something that affects the ribosome complex of an, a bacteria. It will make sure that the proteins created by the ribosomes are, you know, uh, de defective. Now, e coli, there, are, there is a strain of E. coli where they make ribosomes so hyper accurate that it's very accurate, but it's too slow. It, it, it produces proteins so slowly that it cannot survive. So what streptomycin does in such bacteria is that it'll speed up the process of creating beneficial proteins. Meanwhile, the bacteria has already acquired the system of being hyper accurate in creating these proteins. So these bacteria will thrive in an antibiotic environment. So this is the way antibiotic resistance has gone forward. One thing that you can remember is that uh, it, there's an of, often a correlation with the genome size. So streptococcus, you don't need to be very afraid of it being multi-drug resistant as much as Pseudomonas aeruginosa because streptococci, a group A streptococci has a very small genome, which means it cannot 
take the burden of extra resistance genes. However, Pseudomonas it can take up any amount of extraneous genes, and this is why there is a rampant existence of uh, multidrug resistant Pseudomonas. So these are the mechanisms like how genetics have contributed to resistance. So to summarize, we can, uh, the bacteria can have an innate resistosome where the way it has been formed is such that it is innately um, resistant to a bacteria or it can actually modify certain targets in itself to actually re be resistant to a bacteria. There is acquired resistance that you can see on the right side, which you acquire, which they acquire from horizontal gene transfer. And then there is also the adaptive response to the environment there is in. There are so many mechanisms, it can actually be, be a bit uh, overwhelming in terms of looking at everything. But just remember that there are two main ways that the bacteria can withstand the effect. One, it'll either stop the antibiotic in reaching the target in a high enough concentration, or the other, it'll modify or bypass the target itself that the antibiotic can act on. So over time, bacteria has evolved a lot of strategies to accomplish this. We'll be looking into some of these. So we'll go for the first one. Let's see what happens when it tries to stop the antibiotic from reaching its target. So the first thing that the bacteria can do is it can modify cell wall uh, permeability. So uh, for example, gram-negative bacteria, we know that they've got an extra layer of lipopolysaccharide wall that is outside its outer membrane. And this can actually uh, thwart a lot of antibiotics from even entering it. So the core region of lipopolysaccharide is strongly negatively charged. So what happens if you send a negatively charged antibiotic is that it will repel it just on the basis of electric charge. So this is one very common method. And uh, this is uh, usually the kind of uh, things that you expect from gram negative being automatically resistant to antibiotics. So the lipopolysaccharide is what confers that resistance there. Second thing, right now biofilms, there is a lot of research going on in biofilms right now because we, re we realize that it's a major uh, re uh, resistosome or reservoir of antimicrobial resistance. So this is created by something known as quorum sensing. Now, can any, does anyone know what quorum sensing is? If anyone can raise their hand, or if not, I'll just move on into the topic. Okay then, so let's look at what quorum sensing is. Before I talk about what it is, this is a sea squid that you see in the Hawaii. And what you can notice there, the blue color bioluminescence, that is actually uh, caused by Vibrio fishery, a bacteria that is responsible for bioluminescence. So our understanding of bacterial chatter is something that we think that bacteria is so ancient and so primitive that there is no communication between them, like how humans can communicate. But we realize that that's not the case. Bacteria communicate amongst themselves as well. They release these signal molecules, which actually uh, helps them take a kind of census by saying that there, there are two kinds of signal molecules. One would say that, hey, I'm a bacteria. And the bacteria next to it would say, I'm also a bacteria by releasing this signal molecule. There's a more specialized signal molecule that says, I am Staph aureus. So it's basically like saying uh, that you go into a room, you're detecting a lot of Indians. And then in the same group, you're detecting a lot of Malus. And if Malus get together, we might actually go on strike. It's jokes apart, but that's one way how bacteria actually can engage in an attack against your body. You would realize that a certain critical amount has to be reached before a bacteria will start creating effects in your bodies. For example, toxic shock syndrome. It's not one staph aureus that is causing a toxic shock syndrome or 100, but once a critical amount gets uh, accumulated in the body, they all realize that there's enough of bacteria in the body to actually release their virulence. And that is how toxic shock syndrome happens. So coming back to the bioluminescence, let's talk about something nice for a change. This is how Vibrio fishery was working. It would detect enough of bacteria or Vibrio fishery mole uh, signal molecules within its environment that they would suddenly at the same time decide that they can engage in bioluminescence. So biofilms are also made in the same fashion. They realize that there's enough of bacteria out there to create a biofilm. And what is the goal of a biofilm? Twofold. One, it will reduce the antibiotic penetration into the biofilm. There are molecules that the bacteria starts releasing that will actually sequester antibiotics onto the biofilm and prevent the uh, 
um, penetration of antibiotics into their immediate environment. The second thing is that there is a nutrient limitation of a biofilm. Naturally, when you're putting a film over a bacteria, it's also being restricted from the other environment from which it can actually get nutrients. So what happens here is that when there's a nutrient limitation or it's in starvation mode, the growth of bacteria is also slow. So during, and most of the antibiotics that we have actually attack multiplying bacteria. So again, if at all an antibiotic has managed to penetrate the biofilm, it's not going to act very well on a slow growing bacteria. In fact, it takes about 500 to 5,000 times the MIC of antibiotics if you're trying to kill a microbe inside a biofilm. Moving on to the next mechanism, a flux pump. The principle behind this is very simple. Antibiotic enters the bacteria, it gets vomited out. So it's found, these efflux pumps are found in both gram positive as well as gram negative bacteria. And uh, some efflux pumps are very effective in throwing out multiple types of bacteria. Uh, sorry, not bacteria, multiple types of antibiotics. And this can lead to multiple drug resistance. And this is one of the common mechanisms of how tetracyclines gain antibiotic resistance. Now, enzymatic activation, beta lactamase is one of the classic examples for this. So we know that uh, the penicillin groups, they have a four membered beta lactam ring, which is important for uh, its um, antibiotic action. And what beta lactamase does is that it uses hydrolysis to just modify the ring and pull it apart and thus disabling the antibiotic. So this is how it can actually reduce the amount of concentration or the, the concentration within the bacteria so that it does not work. Moving on to modifying or bypassing the target for the antibiotic. So it can camouflage a target or reprogram a target. One of the common examples is when penicillin binding protein, which is uh, which is the methicillin uh, resistant uh, Staph aureus story. So there is the penicillin binding protein onto which methicillin would act on. And what it, what it basically did was it released a new PPB, a PPB2, where beta lactam antibiotics cannot uh, actually affect it. Same thing uh, when it comes to ribosomes, we just talked about E. coli being uh, using up streptomycin, et cetera. So there's a modification in that particular ribosome, which is actually leading to something like that. So target modification is extremely important. And lastly, there is the alternative metabolic pathway. For example, uh, bacteria, there are certain bacteria that would require folate. So it would come up with an alternative metabolic pathway to actually get folate and not in the usual pathway itself. So uh, trimethoprim is a sul the sulfonamide trimethoprim drugs. They usually are showing resistance by changing the alternative metabolic pathway. So these are some of the mechanisms. It's a very exhaustive topic and it's beyond the scope of our talk right now to go in way deep into the molecular mechanisms or to discuss it according to the different classes of antibiotics. But I'm hoping that you're getting somewhat of an idea with what has been discussed here. So what I want you to realize is that resistance is not a new phenomenon and it simply cannot be reversed. We have gotten into this path and then we need to actually do, what we need to do about it is not be irrational in terms of prescribing. So though resistance has emerged by chance, we can actually delay the process of, and we can increase the longevity of an antibiotic. So as a culture, we must begin to think of antibiotics as different from other mechanisms. We need to improve our, improve our prescribing uh, prescriptions of antibiotics. And we should, and even if the patient is demanding antibiotic, if the physician believes that it's not necessary, we need to actually take action and say a no at that particular point. And another uh, area where we can get a lot of antibiotics is the livestock that are actually using antibiotics, not just for prevention of infection, but also for growth. So that is another area that probably at the government level, it should happen. But uh, something else is coming up with vaccines where we can actually um, try to, but all of these things are something that requires a culture change. And that might take some time. However, it's not all doom and gloom. And uh, we are trying to come up with different drugs that can actually uh, help us in terms of uh, stimming superbugs. So instead of coming up with new antibiotics, there are certain researchers that are trying to come up with something that can stop the evolution of antibiotics. And uh, they have actually found out a couple of molecules and it might actually come into um, our practice, like using adjuvants to protect the antibiotics can be the next step, probably. There are a lot of other things that are coming up, but as of now, our best 
mechanism of resistance towards antibiotic resistance would be proper prescriptions. And till then, the evolutionary story will move on. And you have to remember that in this particular picture, we are not the cheetah, we are the gazelle. And uh, that is pretty much what I had to say for this particular webinar. I'm hoping that I wasn't too fast and I was uh, clear about what was going on. Thank you for the opportunity. I would love to take questions. So stop uh, screen sharing. Sure. Kavita. See the any questions in the view box? Actually, there is no uh, questions in the chat box. Actually, so are... I'll ask two questions to Kavita. Kavita, can you hear me? Yes, sir. So one is that uh, you already mm -hmm. just mentioned uh, what about the use of veterinary use of antibiotics and poultry use of antibiotics? How much it will lead to antibiotic resistance? Eh? Second thing is that the, how is the it is clinic, second thing is a uh, clinical question how oh, antibiotic rotation will help to reduce the antibiotic resistance. So the first question of how livestock is actually affecting it is uh, there is we need to realize that it's not just antibiotic and clinical practice that is leading to antibiotic resistance. The environmental presence of antibiotics, both natural as well as uh, what we have added in uh, in the means of synthetic antibiotics that is actually added to this. So whenever we are using uh, antibiotics in livestock, we are actually increasing the presence of antibiotic resistance genes in the environment itself. So the, uh, the in fact, it's gotten so bad that in a country like Denmark, they have stopped all use of antibiotics in their livestock. The surprising thing about that is even despite stopping that, they, uh, their livestock is still good. Uh, they didn't see a decrease in their levels of livestock, which actually shows that you can actually have uh, livestock thriving without any antibiotics. But the situation has gotten so serious that certain countries have taken steps to stop the use of antibiotics in the livestock. So that is actually but, happening in Europe. Somebody told that 80% of the antibiotic resistance is due to veterinary use of antibiotics. Something I would like say that, that 80% uh, would be attributed to the entire environmental uh, resistance. It, it would also include the antimicrobials that we see in, say, soil, uh, the natural as well. But yes, it, it is significant. There, it's not possible to put an exact percentage or number yes, to it, yes. but it is significant. What about uh, antibiotic rotation? Yes, the the antibiotic, yes there, there was a study that actually uh, discussed antibiotic cycling in terms of antibiotic stewardship. And uh, though intuitively, we would think that it would reduce uh, this particular phenomenon. The study was a standalone study which actually said that there wasn't much of a difference. However, uh, that's just one study and I think we can actually try antibiotic cycling or basically throw every arsenal that we have got into uh, the clinical practice just to see whether we can actually create a change for the positive. So, Kavita, it is really very interesting and a very encouraging talk and I don't know how to express my thanks. And uh, uh, happy to see you. And over to Dr. Sajit for further. Sajit. So uh, this, this forum is open and I had made all the participants uh, can unmute themselves. Uh, I invite the MNG Naya to make some comments here. Okay. okay. It was, uh, the talk was very crisp and informative. Uh, of course, uh, I think probably too much for uh, editors like us, you know, we were not educated so much on this. Now, I have, I have one query. See, most of the uh, antibiotics are derived from plants. Plants. Yes. So, so uh, what is your take on utilizing the plants? You know, I, I am slightly interested in research into Ayurveda. Ayurveda Got it. All right. Where most, you know, almost all the drugs are derived from plants. So, so what is your take on this? Utilizing this knowledge in uh, developing some strategy to counter or, or to reduce antibiotic resistance. So what you're essentially talking about is something that comes in the realm of qu quorum quenching. So uh, I did talk about quorum sensing and that is how bacteria chatters amongst themselves and communicates amongst themselves before launching an attack. So what happens, for example, uh, turmeric has curcumin in it. 
and what curcum things like curcumin and other plant um, other extracts that we get from plants do or just like the neem extract mm -hmm. that we get from plant so what they essentially do is what we believe is interfering with quorum sensing so uh, they would come under the categorization of quorum quenching and this is how they have a, an antibacterial effect like we see in all the hand washes, how neem is actually working. So that is another a huge area of research. Quorum, uh, quorum quenchers is a huge, a, a huge area of research, which is very interesting for a pharmacologist like me. But yes, that would be the answer to your question. So if you're using these plants, it's usually in terms of that. But there isn't an antibiotic that has been created to which bacteria has not developed antibiotic resistance to. So our best chance would be for going going for alternative methods like how you have mentioned if we can find uh, it if powerful enough to work fast do um, you think that uh, we should take the lead from india and i hope i hope uh, pharmaceutical astra are doing something about it uh, no, so um, actually astrazeneca as of now it got into the covid space mainly because it's the need of the hour and uh, that is why the COVID vaccine uh, generation is something that the company has taken up on a pro bono basis. But other than that, uh, infect anti-infectives is something that we no longer uh, look into. We are more into the cardiorenal space. And like I previously mentioned, anti-cancer, because that is where the research has gone into right now. So yes, we do need pharmaceutical companies that try to solve this problem as well. It's bigger than we think. Yeah, thank you, Kavita. Probably I would not have taken the trouble of reading so much, but it was really educative. I learned a lot today. Thank, Thank you, you so once much. again. So next, uh, Dr. Uh, we have senior pediatrician, Dr. Parvati Madam is also here. Madam, uh, do you want to ask any questions? Dr. Parvati, please. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, highly informative talk, very nice. Um, Thank you so much, ma'am. Okay. okay. So, uh, back to Lady uh, Madam. Uh, any comments, madam? There's a question here to Kavita. Yes, ma'am. How does a baby about two to three months on exclusive breastfeeding develop resistance to any of the antibiotics in use? That's mainly through contact. Because uh, the baby, once it enters, we consider the amniotic fluid to be a sterile environment. But the, from the moment of birth onwards, it's, a baby is being uh, introduced to the world of microbes. And there could be, uh, for example, antibiotic resistance can come up from staph aureus that is there on the mother's skin. So uh, suppose there is a resistant version of antibiotics. So, Ask, it's about being cognizant about where all antibacteria are. We could actually argue that we are more bacterium than human. We have bacteria on our skin, we have bacteria on our, uh, on our things, and we have to take it for granted that where there is bacteria, there are also pre-existent mutants that are resistant to bacteria. So that would be your answer. Okay, Kavita, thank you. <laughs> So I think there is no further questions and uh, actually we have, uh, we, have, we have next webinar coming up at 8 p.m. So actually I think we can conclude this program. There's one more question. So, uh, what is that disposal of expired antibiotic? Yes, that is how it would increase antibiotics in the environment as well. Inappropriate disposal of antibiotics is a very huge reservoir in terms of actually increasing antibiotic resistance that come from an environmental source. Sorry, Sri you can continue. Uh, uh, Sri just announced tomorrow's program. Sri ah, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Sri uh, this, this tomorrow's, program, tomorrow's program. Last day. Uh, tomorrow is our third day and the last and final day of our antibiotic awareness week program. And we have an excellent speaker, Dr. Vijay Avle, the senior infectious disease specialist. And the past IEP president is talking about antibiotic stewardship and what pediatricians can do. And chaired by Dr. George F. Mulail, the past IAP Kerala president. And uh, uh, tomorrow we will join at 7 p.m., same time, same platform. Uh, so I hope all of you will join tomorrow also. Uh, before going there, I would, I would uh, like to thank Dr. Kavita Varghese for coming to our platform and giving an excellent talk and reminding us and a scary thought of going back to the pre-antibiotic era and also reminding us the uh, how smart the bugs are. 
So thank you for your excellent talk and excellent, wonderful slides and wonderful language also. Uh, so uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Kavila. And I also uh, thank uh, Dr. Uh, Anandagarshan sir, our national uh, vice president, uh, uh, for arranging all these uh, talks, and all the uh, also thank uh, Maranand sir, our EP president, and uh, uh, senior creation sir, uh, MNG Nayas sir, and um, uh, Sarojan madam, and VK Parvati madam, uh, uh, and uh, all the senior pediatricians joined in this what? platform. What and, about uh, the vaccine? Vaccines take COVID vaccine. They are doing it. Oh, okay. Uh, because you are from yes. that same pharma, so we don't have a direct yes. update from the uh, right person. <laughs> yes, um, I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to reveal too much because of the company policy in terms of that. But I would like to say that, yes, we are we are back on track. You must have already gotten from the news that it was paused for the time being. And uh, that is because a serious adverse event had popped up. However, that is standard procedure. And uh, uh, I, I think AstraZeneca has taken a pact with other major companies like Pfizer, et cetera, to actually ensure that though we're trying to get a COVID vaccine as fast as possible, the proper methodology should be followed. So it is kind of uh, encouraging that we are still going forward with it and fingers crossed we can come up with something. But yes, it is uh, back on track. So, okay. Okay, thank you, Kavila, once more. And uh, thank you all of you join us. And good day and good night. I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, everyone.